we're here to talk to you about next generation web styling. And we've got, oh wait, hold on, wait, wait, wait. I was here to help, 12. Oh, 12, well I had the little uh, raptor, oh, anyway. Right. Uh, and yeah. This is going well. <laughs> I'm a developer advocate on Chrome doing CSS. And I'm a developer advocate for material design on the web. And you can follow us online here, as well as follow us into this journey into the future of web code. <laughs> So all of our demos that you're going to see, they are live screen captures, so there's no trickery happening. And we have links to all the demos, which you can see right there, a nerdy.dev, CSS at CDS. And we're going to start with some of the most well-supported features, and then go into things that are definitely coming in the future. Uh, I'm going to start us off with, ah, scroll snap. Kick it and off. Notice that we have uh, a little bar chart there under there that tells you the uh, amount of support that we have. And we're going to start with things that have great support. And by the end, we're going to find things that have no support. So off scroll snap, one of my favorite things here is that the support is great. It's touch enabled, 60 frames per second, native scrolling for every platform. There's no synthetic scrolling with scroll snap points, and it's all organic. It's not organic. Anyway, whatever. It's mobile and desktop for free. And my pro tip with off scroll snap is make sure that you try to keep it horizontal, because when you do it vertically, it kind of feels like scroll hijacking. So let's look at a little diagram. We've got our viewport is in the center. Each dot represents a snap point item. And this is basically a carousel uh, where the items snap to the inline start. And let's see a demo, because we love animations. So we have a horizontal snap point demo here. This feels like a carousel. We're looking at shirts by Ten Hun, a rad Seattle artist. And we have a scroll X, so we have overflow container on the section. We're snap starting, we're throwing, and we're allowing skipping. So scroll snap stop, or you can tell it to stop at one at a time in case you don't want to let them throw. And it always settles perfectly. So got to love that. And did you know, well, I'm sure you did because I mentioned it earlier, you can do it vertically. So here I'm doing vertically, same CSS. I've pretty much just flipped the X for a Y, and I've told it to align center because that just looks so good. Mm, I like it. Nice. And here's the kicker. Did you know you can do both directions? <laughs> <laughs> Matrix Ooh. snap. And basically, you just say overflow and uh, you know, scroll snap type both and align in the center. And I want to call out to that over scroll behavior contain. That's so if somebody hits the end and they keep swiping, they won't, uh, the scroll event won't leak outside and go into the next item. So, kind of cool. All right, so now we're going to talk about focus within, which solves a lot of accessibility elements when you're focusing within those elements. So if you wanted to create a menu bar, oftentimes we see menu bars with drop downs or flyouts that occur within those list items. So you could have a list that's inside of your navigation. You could have some markup like this, where you have list item one, list item two. Inside that list item, you have this unordered list with more items. We see this pattern a lot. And if we want that sub menu here to appear or be displayed when you hover over its parent element, we can apply some CSS to style it. So it could look like this, where on hover or on focus of that element, because you always want to have a focus style when you are creating hover styles, we want to make sure that inside list becomes visible and has a display. In theory, we could then write code like this, where we say visibility visible with opacity 1, display block. But as we're tabbing through here, we're actually not able to see the elements inside of that second list item, which we've applied that sublist within. And that's because we're using focus. When you style with focus, when you're tabbing into the parent using that focus style, you will have those children visibly appear. But when you tab to the next tabbable elements, they disappear because we're no longer focusing on the parent. So you lose that style. Now, if you use focus within, it solves those problems because you're actually telling the browser to apply that style when you're focusing within a parent element. So that could look like this. All we have to do is swap focus to focus within. And when we tap through these over here, you see that sub-navigation appear, and we've solved that accessibility problem. Cool demo. I like it. These are all the cool new media queries we have. Uh, and I said prefer slash star because we're, uh, we have a lot of preferences that we can bring to the table now. We can consider uh, our users' preferences and adapt our UI UX to lean into those. I also think these are kind of design surfaces. These are new design opportunities, these contexts and use cases. The way that they work for all of us webheads is the browser is our proxy for all this. The system and our platform sets these settings. They trickle down into our browser and come in the form of a media query. Here's a quick overview of some of the device preferences you might see on Mac OS, Windows, uh, iOS, and Android. These things get as cool as adjust contrast and font size and theme uh, personalization, right? I love it. Super cool. So here's our first one. This one's pretty popular. Look at the support. It's pretty good. It's a hook to pacify movement for folks that are sensitive to movement. 
And uh, you have the option of no preference or to reduce the motion, supports killer, and I have a fun demo that I wanna show you real quick. So we have an animation that's pretty wobbly. Uh, we have mixing of colors happening, but if the user prefers reduced, instead of removing the animation, I crossfade. This is an important thing I wanna share with y'all that reduced motion does not mean no motion. Anyway, this, I thought that was a cool demo. <laughs> and so, I got really worked up there. Uh, DevTools has got your back in case you want to test it. So just pop it open, go to the rendering tab, which you can get there from the like, snowman that's on the left of console there, and you can change the properties and test your work. It's super cool. Another one that's pretty popular, which you might have noticed on the Chrome Dev Summit site, is prefers color scheme, light or dark, so you can adapt uh, your UI for your user's preference on their eyes. It's really hot right now. My mom is on dark mode. Hi, mom. You're in my talk now. And here it is again. Uh, we have a little bit of code here. We have a little demo. CSS or CDS site is a good example of this. And I have a hot tip, which is uh, to follow some of the, the HSL patterns that we've seen with Yuna's demo. So we'll have a code pen demo in that link that we shared. And there, you can just sort of flip a, cu a couple custom properties and watch the whole site pretty much invert. Super rad. And again, DevTools has got your back. And in here, you can simulate both of those so that you don't have to go into your operating system and click a checkbox and go back to Chrome and do it all right inside of here. I'm showing that inside of Chrome Canary, so uh, make sure you're in Canary when you're checking right now. So here's a bunch of media queries, just a little fast pass for ones that are coming down the pipe. Uh, and look at all these design opportunities, prefers contrast, prefers reduced motion, forced colors, and light level dim. And now we ha can have users that say something like this, I prefer high contrast, dark mode motion when in dim lit environments. <laughs> and we can do that with CSS. We can handle that. It's kind of cool. Anyway. I love that browsers are becoming so much more personalized to our needs. And us as developers, we can now create styles that work with our brand, but also work for all those different preferences. It's super cool. So logical properties are another thing that allows for really speaking to your users and creating dynamic directional spacing within and around elements. This is really important to maintain layout integrity across translations and writing modes. Right now, in a left to right based and top to bottom based language like English, we think like this. We think about height and width, and we think of top and bottom, left and right. So it's kind of like this um, compass rose aesthetic here when we think about layout on the web. But with logical properties, that sort of changes. Height, becomes, height and width become block size and inline size. Left and right become the um, inline start and inline end. And top and bottom become block start and block end. You may be familiar with some of these concepts if you've used logical properties within CSS Grid. But instead of thinking about layout like this, top, right, bottom, left, with height and width, we think of it like this, in this new mental model. And when we do this, we actually get a lot back from the browser. With these logical properties, when we use them to write code, the browser actually creates adjustments for us based on the writing mode and the direction of the language. So in a left to right language like English, margin inline start would refer to margin left. In a right to left language, that would be margin right. In some Japanese, typography, that might be a margin top in a vertical right-left language. So we don't have to make all these calculations ourselves. The browser is actually doing it for us. So for something like a block start, that would refer to the block flow on the page instead of the inline documents in the page. And for here, for both left to right and right to left languages, the margin block start refers to the margin top. And for a vertical right to left language, that would start at the margin right, because the block flow would go from right to left. Without logical properties, as you change the direction and writing mode, the layout integrity falls apart. Our boxes collapse, that border top becomes misplaced, the text is overlapping, and it starts to look a little bit like a mess. But with logical properties, we can have the browser do that work for us. When we're using logical properties in this layout, instead of using height, we've used block size, and instead of using width, we've used inline size. And this allows for the boxes to not collapse when we're creating a vertical layout. Instead of the margin left, we're using a margin inline start here on those headers and paragraphs. So as we swap directions, we still have the style of that layout maintained. And finally, in this main section here, for the border, we are using border block start and margin block start instead of a border top and margin top. And that's what's making that border retain its spacing. So you can write code like this or you can write code like this, and it's the same amount of code, same number of lines. It's just changing the mental model of how you write it. And the browser does all of that great work for you to make that website more internationalized. 
logical props, y'all. Uh, there was a little hack I found. It's not a hack, it's just a good shortcut. If you do border block, you can do borders on just the tops and bottoms. Can't really do that shorthand any other way. So if you want a little sneaky way to get started with logical Love props, it. start there. I made a tweet about it. I don't know if you saw it. Anyway, this is about sticky situations. Uh, this is a CSS sticky, a really fun property that I like. Here's a sweet diagram. And one of my th favorite things about sticky is you can see that as we scroll, so there's paper and a viewport there, the item is in flow with the document. But as soon as it reaches the point at which I've told it to stick with CSS sticky, it gets locked into the viewport. The page can keep scrolling until it comes back to the position at which it was in flow, and it becomes back and is a member of the page. Here's a nice little demo. I call this one the sticky stack. This is a classic sticky. There's nothing tricky with the sticky. <laughs> Just setting the top to zero. Uh, anyway, the HTML for this ends up being what's more interesting. So I just have position sticky top zero there. Let's check on the HTML. I chose to use the definition list for this group list. And notice how the DT elements are siblings. So a definition list goes DL, DT, and then DDs are all the different artists there. And this is why they share the same sticky space, is they actually have the same parent. So let's look at an example where they're cousins. We get the sticky slide. And the sticky slide is where one appears to go out while the other one comes in. And the only difference, this is the same CSS, is that we have a different parent. So our cousins, are uh, that's where we're cousins now. And this is my favorite example. This is sticky desperado. And that's because the sticky element looks really desperate to hang out with its friends. <laughs> right? I'm like, ah, just go away, bro. Uh, Anyway, the um, only difference here is the HTML. I got a display grid went sideways, and it's still the sticky slide, as we saw before. I love those demos, and they're all going to be available at the link that we share, so you can go there and use them for your navigations. I'm really excited to also talk about backdrop filter. This allows you to do a style adjust behind an element, not just on an element, when you want to apply filters to that element. Right now, you can apply CSS filters. They're great. They're super dynamic. They allow for a non-destructive layer transformation on top of any applied elements. And often, we see filters used on images. But you can also use them on hover effects and transformations, on icons, links, menu bars, and even video if you wanted to. A cool feature that I recently discovered in DevTools is that all of these values for the filters are actually pre-filled, so you can see what they do and what input arguments they take. So I thought that was awesome hat tip to DevTools. Now, when you're creating a backdrop filter, it allows for you to apply those filter styles behind an element. So here we're applying the backdrop filter of blur on top of a text element. This aesthetic here previously was not possible without a bunch of weird CSS and JavaScript hacks to make this really work. But now you can do it in one line of CSS. So here I have a video where I'm applying this blur backdrop filter to that bottom left header. And you can see that you can apply different properties to it. You can use this for a blur or lightness or contrast or any of those filter types. And so this can be used to increase legibility of a piece of text on top of an image, and so many more things that we're just starting to discover because we just got this in browsers, and I'm so excited about it. I do love backdrop filter. It's all over VizBug. It looks good. Is selector, so this is a modern, uh, newer spec version of what we've had for many years, any and matches. In fact, it's 10 plus years old. Uh, it's super handy. I'm a big fan. And I'm just going to show you a video because it pretty much sells the whole value bam. of it right here. <laughs> It's a what? It's like bam. Oh, bam. Watch right away. Ah, is. I so like you. Nice. What were you before? <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, I'm too just much kidding. code. <laughs> it was great. It was great still before, right? Oh, and now we have gap. It's not just grid gap, it's gap. It's coming to Flexbox. That means this is the spacing between your children. Your kid your children don't have to your kids. I'm a dad. Your children <laughs> don't have should I start calling nodes kids? That'd be funny. No, don't, don't do that. Not. Yeah, I agree. I shouldn't do that. Um, and so on the left, we see what margin is doing. And margin is where each child owns its spacing. And on the right, we see gap, where the container owns the spacing. And we've all felt the pain of what it's like when children are managing their spacing. So I made this demo. This is in the awesome Firefox dev tools. We have a grid on top, a flex box on bottom. Both of them are just using the same gap and the same definition. And we see them competing for a better layout strategy here. And one of the best things about this is, is we see Flexbox gap being an amazing, amazing feature for us. This is one spacing declaration instead of whatever might have been many. So lobotomized owl, I don't think we need you anymore. You were great, though, until then. This is a good demo here, where we have the spacing between. This matches the diagram that we saw. Display flex, flex wrap, and gap. Hey, wrap and gap rhyme. And we can end the debate if our button, when our buttons have icon left, icon right, and all these different members in the child button here. We can end the debate by just putting a gap on it. 
There's so many times that I've hacked around Gap that I'm stoked to see that in browsers. I'm also super excited about CSS Houdini hitting browsers. Woo, yeah, shout out to Houdini. CSS Houdini is a low-level API for CSS that gives developers the ability to tell the browser how they want it to read and understand custom CSS. This is what that looks like. It provides developers access to the CSS object model in a much more consumable way. Previously, if you wanted to style anything on a web page that didn't currently exist by using properties in CSS, you had to write a JavaScript polyfill for it, which not only convoluted your logic and your styling code, but it also was way slower, because you'd have to wait for the website to read your DOM and the CSS object model and go through the whole cascade layout paint composite step, and then you'd have to reapply whatever JavaScript at whatever point updated your page to have that repaint and to have it recomposite. And so we don't want that. With Houdini, you can now tell a browser from the CSS level how you want it to draw your page. So it gets that from the very start. And that means more performance, powerful, and extensible styling on the web. Houdini is the intersection of work done to improve browser performance, give developers and designers more power to translate their visions onto the web, and to extend what's possible in the set of CSS properties that we have today. It's really this umbrella term that covers a few different APIs. And those APIs are the Layout API, the Paints API, the Parser API, the Properties and Values API, the Animation Worklet, the Typed Object Model, and the Font Metrics API. If you want more info about any of these, Is Houdini Ready Yet is a great resource created by Surma that shows you all of these specs, their current place and time, and when they're covering. Today, we'll be covering the Paint uh, Properties and Values API, the Typed Object Model, and Animation, because they are the most supported now. So let's start with properties and values. These allow you to extend custom properties, extend the capabilities that we have today when we're creating custom properties or CSS variables on the web. Right now, you can write a custom property by giving a name and a value, but that value is string-based. With registered custom properties, this Houdini custom property, you can give that a syntax, initial value, so you have fallback values, and say if it inherits from its parent or not. So this allows for a lot of really cool things, like error checking and creating visuals that previously were not possible on the web. Without registered custom properties, if you try to animate a gradient, for example, it just doesn't work. Whether you're trying to animate that gradient inside the gradient itself or using this custom property here to try to do it, the browser can't comprehend what you're trying to tell it to do. In this example, I'm trying to animate from a red to pink to a blue to pink gradient on hover with a one second smooth transition. But the browser has trouble interpolating these values in this context. Now, if we register a custom property and call it gradient start, we can set a syntax to that property so that the browser knows what to expect. So here we're setting a syntax of color. And this is the exact same code that we saw before, but we are seeing that smooth one second transition because we've now told the browser that gradient start is a color and to look out for that. And it knows how to interpolate now between those color values. Custom properties are great for design systems. They're great for type checking your CSS. In this example, we have a custom property called color primary that we've given an initial value of deep pink. When we have some code here, I don't necessarily have to say what color primary is. I don't have to specify it in either the global or in the element level. It just knows to read from deep pink because we've registered it on the CSS interface. We can still override that value very easily using the cascades. Here I'm overriding color primary as blue. But if we have something that's invalid, like a number here, this will fall back to deep pink. Without a registered custom property, the CSS would just ignore that line, and it would appear like a blank box. We would just see white background. So having this really allows for type checking in CSS, which I think is really cool. Also, I think this is even more exciting. The feature syntax for this is all going to be in CSS. So just like you can write custom properties in the root now, you can write all of your property declarations in your CSS and keep them all in the same file, and it's going to be great. It's just a vision of the future that I see. A tear. CSS, CSS. Oh, man, logical properties are sweet. <laughs> All right, typed OM. So this is where you, you need to ask the DOM for a value that's like, what's the current CSS value? And right now, you get a string. And it's kind of hard if you want to add something to it or remove something from it. And so what do we have upcoming? The typed OM. We're going to get objects, y'all. Super cool. So anyway, uh, here's a good example. I pulled up the Chrome Dev Summit website. I have a little GIF of me typing the old way. So I'm going to stash this selector for an H1. I'm going to ask the window to get a computed style of this H1. And then after that, I'll say, I need 
a computed property, and uh, it's gonna, I'm going to want the font size, and it says 34 pixels. And that's what design tools have been dealing with for all these years. But what they're going to get here is I can ask the H1 directly for a style map, and they get the font size back, and I get the value in the unit broken out. It's super neat. <laughs> I, that, I, I think, you know, this book is really going to love this. Any design tool is really going to love it. And really, if you're doing any JavaScript computation, it's going to be really nice. So on the left, we have what we used to do, which is string-based regex parsing. And you'd have to disassemble and reassemble. With type to whim, you ask, you math, you set. It's super rad. Here's the JavaScript of today, just so in case you need to copy, paste it, screenshot it. Right? We're asking the window for a computed style of an H1 and its font size. But tomorrow, we can just ask the H1 for a style map and a get call for its font size. And you get more here, too. You get conversion, clamping, error handling, and more. So you can't really mess that one up as much as you could the previous one. I love this semantic CSS. It's happening on the web. It's so exciting. The Paint API is also something that's super exciting, because you can now create your own paint functions using a Canvas-like syntax. Before we get into the Paint API, we should talk briefly about worklets, because the Paint API is one such worklet. Worklets live in a separate thread from your main thread, meaning they don't take up page resources or slow down your site to apply styling changes like this Paint worklet would do. They're similar to web workers like service workers. They're registered to your page, and they contain all the instructions that live it outside the main thread and can be acted upon when called. So Houdini worklets work in very much the same way. To get a Houdini worklet into your code base, you do the following. You first would write and register your worklet definition in JavaScript. So here, because I'm showcasing a paint worklet, I would say register paint, give it a name, and then have all of the paint code being pulled inside there. Then we want to invoke that worklet file by using add module on the CSS interface inside of, say, the HTML here. So here we have script css.paintworklet.addmodule, and then the name that we gave it. And then finally, we can use that worklet by that name. So I called it fun here. We can say background paint, the type of worklet that we're pulling in here, and then the name. So it could look like this. This is an example of a uh, pixel art sort of rainbow top to bottom uh, example that's just painting colors on an element. First, I'm checking for support by saying if type of register paint is not equal to undefined. Then I'm going to write out the worklet saying register paint, give it a name. And then inside of that, I'm pulling in the context and size of the elements for which I'm applying the worklet to. So I can set a size, that height and width from that element, and then I could fill the context there. Then in the HTML, we have the class box that we're going to apply this to, and we're going to add that worklet to the CSS interface. And finally, in CSS, all we have to do is write background image, paint, and then rainbow ties. That's the name that I gave this worklet. But it doesn't only have to be a background image. You can use these worklets anywhere. So I can also use this as a border image, that exact same worklet logic, but instead of a background, I'm applying it as a border, and you get a very different effect. For a few other examples of what you can do with the Paint API, I created this website, this library called extra.css. And what this showcases is just the, prop the power of custom properties and paint worklets and what you can do with them. You could change all of these different values inside of your code for sparkles, or if you wanted to create a scalped border inside of your code with one line of code, um, changing different properties like color and width. Why have one underline when you can have many underlines? <laughs> So here, it's just, it showcases how much power and fun you could have when you can tell the browser how you wanted to understand the code that you're writing, especially the styling code, which we previously didn't have that much access to. And finally, let's end with some confetti. The talk's not over yet, just this part. <laughs> For a more practical example, I played with recreating angled corners on the web using Houdini. This currently isn't possible on the web, but it is possible in other platforms like Android and iOS. And so in the material spec, we have angled corners, but it's not something that we can do in our platform. And I wanted our platform to have nice things, too. So I had a few requirements. The first was that I wanted to make sure I could set each corner individually, just like you can with border radius. And I wanted to make sure this was a truly cut element, which meant that the ripple wouldn't extend past the element itself. I wanted the frame to end at those corners. So I used a mix of custom properties and input arguments for this. Here's that worklet itself. So I'm registering the paint, giving it a name, angled corners. And then I'm pulling in these input properties, these custom properties. I'm telling the worklet to look out for values that I'm going to then use inside the worklet itself. 
You can also pass custom input arguments. So here I'm doing static get input arguments, and I'm setting the syntax for these input arguments. In this case, the syntax is a custom identifier. And so here I'm looking for that custom identifier to be a string field or outline to show two different modes of using this worklet. Then I can use the context, the size, the properties, and arguments to build out this worklet. And so what I'm doing here is I'm building this canvas angled shape. And I'm getting the properties, the size. I'm using that to actually determine where I'm placing those points. And finally, here I'm calling for the argument of outline. I'm checking for that string. If it's an outline mode, then I'm going to use a stroke to apply the style. If not, I'm going to fill it. So that's because for these angled buttons, I first set the corner radius, and then I want to create a mask on all the buttons to make sure that nothing goes outside of the end of those buttons. So that's where this WebKit mask paint angled corners in a filled mode comes from. There's other types of buttons in material, and one of those is the outlined button. So here I'm using the outlined argument I'm setting a couple of more properties here, the paint color and the stroke weight, and I'm using the exact same worklet to apply a border image that's then painting this on top. So for the outline button, I'm using a mask and a border image with the same worklet. So all together, it looks like this. You can also use these as uh, CDNs, so you could include this as a CDN in your file and then set your custom properties and include that line of code that says I want angled corners, and it's just really exciting time. But I know this is talk about future CSS. I still get this question a lot. But what does it look like in unsupported browsers? Well, it looks like this. Here's what it looks like in IE 11. This is emulated on browser stack. You don't get the angled corners, but these buttons still function well, and you still have your UI there. I think this is a great example of progressive enhancement. You can have great UX across browsers, but you don't have to have pixel-perfect identical interfaces. So I want to free you of that construct, of that burden. I think that you can use Houdini today in a way that is decorative and can enhance your UIs without making it a core part of your UI. So when you do have things fall back, check to make sure they work, but don't be afraid of using these future thinking properties. I turn to you. I love that you used the same worklet across multiple use cases. It was a border image, it was a mask, it was a border, it was a so background. So useful. Ah, so rad. Let's talk about the animation worklet. This is off the main thread animation. This is where your first party animation, you're not going to be chasing something with a request animation frame. You are included at the core. This is it's so different. And what I've built is a demo that kind of brings all of this stuff together that we've been talking about today. So really quick, just like a paint worklet, we create a class which implements the Houdini animation interface, which really just means it has a function called animation. Then we add the module to the CSS object model. And since ours is an animation, we don't really do much in the CSS after that point. Uh, so let's see a demo, just so kind of what I'm talking about. I built a tabs component, which might not be that exciting. But notice our little indicator on the bottom. It's always in sync with the scroll zone. I can click to go to my different tabs. I can use tab and spacebar to navigate with accessibility. And whether it's on responsive desktop or on mobile, I have touch and I have everything. And this is uh, really exciting to me. So, how did I get there? What this is, this is Houdini plus a scroll timeline. And so the, we can pass a new tick to Houdini. And what that means is usually your tick is usually the screen refresh rate, but now we can send it to scroll position of something else. So since I created a, a CSS grid layout that had scrolling snap points, I create a keyframe effect, I create a scroll timeline that points to that scrolling space, and I pass in some options for initial state, like how many tabs there are and what's the maximum scroll. And I give that to the animation worklet, and then we get a gorgeous 60 frames per second scrolling and uh, in sync tab component. So here's what my keyframe effect looks like. The keyframe effect is kind of like if you make an at keyframes animation, but you only take one little piece out of it. You can kind of make many little pieces and then assemble them later. Uh, it's really cool. If you haven't heard of a keyframe effect. The scroll timeline is also cool. So this is new. This is where uh, I'm creating a scroll timeline. And notice it's scroll. There's going to be other timelines in the future. So what we're going to be able to do is not just rely on one type of tick. We can specify many and create our animations that are like reactive to different things. So this one is reactive to the scroll source, which is called section. And I give it a width, uh, uh, like kind of, I clamped a length there. And I create a worklet called tabs. The constructor takes in some initial props and sets state. I have the animate function that's going to get called on tick, and it does the math, which uh, is going to calculate the position. All together now, this is my tab.controller. So I'm going to create a new animation that's um, spinning up my worklet. I'm going to name it. 
well, I'm going to reference it by name. I'm going to pass in my keyframe effect. I'm going to pass in my scroll timeline. There's my initial state that we were talking about earlier. And then I say animation.play, and nothing happens. Why? Because the tick is not the screen refresh rate. It's my scroll position. You have to scroll to make it go. And I think that's really cool. So we got everything in here. We have touch. We have uh, mouse. We have keyboard. Everything's ready to go. This is on a glitch. Fork it and check it out. It's super rad. And this is something that I got really inspired by. Once I made that demo, my brain started going nuts about the reactive animations I could create. And I saw this GIF, and I was like, I could do that with Houdini and scroll timeline. We've got a vertical scroll snap and a horizontal scroll snap. And all we're doing is reacting to the position of those things. And we're letting them snap, and we want people to be able to touch and push those things any way that they want. I'm starting to talk fast, and that's because it's time for... Speed round! Speed round! Get off, Adam! OK, here we go. So we got size. This lets you set height and width in one fell swoop. We've got aspect ratio, which allows for your media to retain its dimensions, meaning you can avoid those awkward stretch or swish images, or when you're trying to use a web page and the web page starts to move around because the images are loading in. This prevents that. Aspect ratio allows for those images to actually have their own aspect ratio. Yes. Woo! We got min, max, and clamp. And this is the ability for us to set constraints on any CSS property that you want. We don't have to do min width and max width and width. We can just specify a min and a max and clamp it. Lists don't have to be boring anymore. With the upgraded list style capabilities in Chrome 79, you can have SVG and emoji. And if you wanted to play with smile again, maybe animated SVG. I don't know. Do your thing. Animated little arrows. Read me. Read me. <laughs> that would get so annoying. All right, we have display. It can take two parameters now. You can specify how it's uh, fitting in the outer scope of the block level and how its inner should work. Regions in CSS allow us to fill a region, an area, with content. So you might be familiar with this concept if you ever used InDesign to lay out books or brochures. Essentially, you can create areas of code that flow into and out of different boxes, and your code doesn't have to be just rectangular. This works really great for grids, where you can define your various regions and have that text flow into and out of those regions. Well those said. Cases that Nailed it. Really CSS lie. modules. So now we've got JavaScript can ask for a module, whether it's from remote or local, and it gets a rich object back. Super nice. Oh, we can't forget oh, subgrid. Sub How did we almost forget that in I the list? Know. I don't know. That one's not cool. List. Wait, that one's amazing. I know. <laughs> this is coming in Firefox 71, and this allows for you to create micro layouts along with macro layouts that use CSS Grid. Stoked. Wow, we did uh, 20 and 30 lot. there. That was 20, that was 20 CSS pieces. and 30. Anyway, we made it. We made it. So we, we can all take a deep breath. You've made it with us. Thank you for joining us in this journey. Check out that URL for all of the resources, for links to all of our demos. Also, if you're here, come and talk to us. We'll be outside in the sandboxes for Fizzbug and for material design. Um, if you're watching this online, feel free to tweet at us. We love talking about this stuff. I think that's all we have for you today. And we're definitely out of time. So thank you again. Thank you. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs>